All right. So we're going to get started. It is that magical time. So welcome everyone to the Radical Reuse with Community Glue workshop with Carla Bruni here. Um, my name is Erin and I am the guest ambassador coordinator at the Nature Museum and I am also part of the Nature Museum Chicago Conservation Corps team along with my colleagues who are also joining us today. I want to do a little wave. We have Marjorie. Hello. We have Jeanette. Hello. And you'll see Rebecca there. She's having some technical issues, but she is with us. You'll probably see her in the chat. Um, so they are the team of the Chicago Conservation Corps at the Nature Museum. And we train and support a network of volunteers who implement environmental service projects that improve the quality of life in our neighborhoods. We strive to empower Chicagoans to work on sustainability issues that affect their communities by getting their communities engaged in that effort. And we support and stand with Chicagoans and community organizations fighting for justice and working to provide resources to Chicago's communities of color. We recognize that intersectionality of sustainability and social justice and that we can care or we can't care for our environment without caring for the people in our communities. And C3 has a broad network of leaders and partners across the city. If there are any resources you would like to us to amplify or if you need help at this time, please just let us know by either emailing us at c3 at naturemuseum.org or calling at 773-755-5100, extension 5277. Also, if you're a current C3 leader and you're looking to start up a C3 project, please reach out to us. We can make that happen. Uh, but we couldn't make this all happen without the support of our local partners. We usually host a sustain sustainability leadership training course twice a year in the spring and in the fall. The course is eight weeks long and it covers a very broad span of sustainability topics. And we were very sorry to have to cancel the spring's leadership training. Uh, but we are very excited to share our partners expertise and bring a little tiny taste of C3 to all of you that are tuning in today. Uh, anytime again during today's presentation, please feel free to write your questions in the chat window. We'll answer them at the end of the presentation and we'll also be recording this webinar um, to share afterwards too. So I would now like to introduce Carla Bruni, the co-founder of Community Glue Workshop. Carla was going to present during our leadership training course during our waste and recycling themed class, but we are very honored and very, very thankful that uh, she could join us in this format instead. So thank you so much for joining us, Carla. Totally my pleasure. Um, thank you guys for having me. I've, I've uh, done this uh, maybe two or three times before with C3. Um, it's hard to do it on a computer because I'm usually like really like emphatic and like running around and shaking my hands a lot while I'm talking. So, so hopefully I'll, I'll do an okay job um, today with you guys. Um, should I just go ahead and, and launch in, Erin? Yeah, that would be fantastic. Let's All see. right, great. Um, uh, first of all, I should say, like, when I was, uh, you know, like I said, I've, I've done this presentation before, um, but of course, like, and I loved, you know, that whole intro is wonderful um, about what you guys do and what you guys believe. Um, you know, it's just, you know, honestly, I was trying, I was sort of struggling with how to talk about, um, you know, these repair clinics I run in light of everything that's happening in the world and in the city right now and, like, why does this like seemingly really small effort um, matter? And how do I, you know, um, really convey what it has meant to me um, and how I think it's useful? Uh, and you know, but but my job basically out in the world, uh, community glue workshop is is a is like a passion project that I've been doing for like maybe eight years now. Uh, hence uh, the the ninety Sundays slide that you guys will see soon. But um, you know, it's. Um, my my background is historic preservation. So basically, uh, I work to save buildings all the time. I mean, I do it for a lot of different reasons. I do it because I care about people, because I care about communities, because um, I care about the environment. Um, and, you know, of course, uh, you know, black and brown communities are disproportionately affected by env environmental and social ills, right? Um, so this presentation is split into two sections, basically. The first is why I sort of started this whole thing. Um, in 2012, um, and you know, my my journey to try to understand how we got to this place where we just destroy so much, you know, <laughs> trying to figure out and wrap my brain around it a little bit because I think if you don't know sort of why you're doing something and have a really deep sort of ethical, uh, you know, ethics behind it, um, you know, it'll kind of peter out on you. I've noticed, um, 
And the second is just more about the logistics of the clinics and the people who make it work. Um, usually, you know, talking to a C3 crowd, people are trying to figure out their own projects and stuff. So there's a bit about that. Um, so it feels like a small thing in amid the current state of the world, but also I just want to say like on my walks lately, um, and, you know, at the protests and on my social media prowls and all of that, um, you know, seeing people come together in community around what's going on has, has meant a ton. Um, I feel like that's the, the bright spot in a lot of this, um, even amid a pandemic, we're coming together like that. Um, my friends are also going into you know neighborhoods all the time and, and a lot of other people I know colleagues and sweeping things up and repairing um, and cleaning up you know as much as they can even in neighborhoods that aren't their own so um, so that's um, made me think you know a project like community glue workshop which is really entrenched both in sort of you know uh, you know the environment um, but also in community I was like all right I think you know we actually kind of got that right <laughs> so um, so that made me feel good. And I feel uh, like, you know, this is uh, maybe more more relevant in its way. You know, we can all kind of go out and just do what we can personally around these issues. Um, and it does actually make a difference. So I just wanted to sort of acknowledge that before I launched into my normal presentation, because I would feel just wrong to not do that. But um, uh, but with that, I think I will actually get started here Perfect. in earnest. <laughs> Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, the 90 Sundays is just because again, it started in 2012, which is kind of hard to believe now, but, um, but it's been so many years, but we just, you know, we do these repair clinics just once a month. Um, uh, but uh, sort of uh, why I uh, launched into it in the first place was um when I was in grad school in the mid 2000s, I got really into environmental issues. Again, I was studying historic preservation, which is about uh, you know sort of saving old buildings uh, for the most part. Uh, but also, the green building movement was really coming up around then, and so I was like, why aren't these two fields talking to each other more? Uh, and then I became sort of obsessed with trying to understand, you know, how we got into this environmental predicament. Basically, um, you know, I don't think you can really effectively, uh, you know. Have, make any change happen unless you know what the root causes of things are. So I, uh oh, oh, here. Okay. Um, so basically I did like every job after I graduated, <laughs> like I said, no, no to nothing. Um, I just voraciously was trying to understand the environment, um, why people didn't want to save old buildings, you know, specifically a lot of the time, but also did a lot of work with uh, EPA and other groups um, just trying to sort of to get it. And, and basically, you know, I just sort of came to the conclusion that, um, our, our main problem was that we throw everything away, like everything. Um, it's, <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous between planned obsolescence, um, you know, encouraging things and, you know, sort of extreme capitalism, of course, but, uh, but also like what happened to us? Like how, how did we get here? Um, you know, in this sort of ridiculous place that we find ourselves, right? So um, this, this is, you know, my, my version of human history in, in about two minutes, um, again, coming from an architectural historian point of view. So it's very architecture focused, uh, but this is how I understand it, right? So we had, um, you know, we start out with fire circles and cooperation. There's no hierarchy here. We're all just sort of sitting around and helping each other, doing whatever. Uh, and then we get to this point where we're like, oh, we can create shelter, how exciting. Um, we can keep our, our heads dry and bend things to our will and uh, sort of make them work for us, right? Very simple, only using things around us that are, are locally available. You know, then we get like a little, uh, a little more specialized and we start, you know, building things like cathedrals. Um, you know, we have new kinds of technologies uh, around this and uh, people who actually really specialize in these fields and we make these amazing things happen and then they take you know, a gazillion years to complete, but they're just these remarkable things that we have. Then we're like, okay, so we got that down, figured it out. Um, but you know, it took a while. So like, why don't we, why don't we try and do this faster? Right? Like, let's see how, how quickly we can build all of these things nowadays. Um, and then we were like, well, that's really cool. But like, let's, you know, now that we can build big things, big things and build things quickly, let's build these sort of mega cities, um, 
you know, as many skyscrapers as we can and really just sort of gobble up as many resources um, as we can. And then we were like, well, you know, we don't have to drag things, you know, on these, you know, like, and, and haul them around by hand anymore. So, you know, let's build, let's build highways. We've got cars. We have all of these other machines to help us uh, sprawl and get, get out further and further from these city centers. And then, you know, we get to a point where we're all like, oh, we got our, our little single family homes and we're, um, you know, pretty much have everything we want. It's even affordable now because it's mechanized and we can get to and fro easily. So, so now I don't really want to have to do, you know, too much, you know, let's figure out how to make my life easier, even on my little plot of land here. Uh, this is actually a Lustron home. These are pretty cool because, uh, they're made of porcelain enamel tile. If you guys have ever been to a White Castle, White Castles are made out of this. Uh, and you can literally like hose it down. But the inside is also something you can completely hose down. Um, every component is built into it. They're sort of fascinating. Um, if you ever need to replace anything, you have to basically take the entire house apart. So they didn't um, <laughs> make, they didn't make too, too many of them. But, uh, but anyway, just making my point here. Uh, uh, and then, you know, it was like, well, why should I have to lift a hose, you know, instead of, um, you know, having to clean even that myself, I'm going to hire people to do it. So this sort of this obsession we have with no maintenance, um, which we see a lot of times with windows um, in, in preservation, for example, we joke a lot about how, you know, window, a lot of the windows that you replace with, they're like, you never have to repair a window again. Um, and that's usually because you can't repair new windows. <laughs> they just sort of um, melt and fall apart on you. Um, but anyway, this is all about us outsourcing at this point, right? So we're even less uh, connected to these things. And today we're basically just have like a complete lack of curiosity. You know, we, we drop things off, um, other people fix them. We don't know what's under there. We literally just kind of don't even want to lift the hood. Um, things have become more complicated in a lot of ways. So we're told also that we shouldn't uh, even try to fix these things, of course. Um, and they are very difficult to fix a lot of the time if you don't have certain equipment uh, and uh, frankly, a lot of education around it in a way that you didn't necessarily need to have. So um, this complete lack of curiosity, you know, I think is leading us to the apocalypse. Um, if you know me at all, you know, pretty much every presentation I give has an apocalypse slide, so I'm sorry. And this one has a couple. So uh, our landfills, um, you know, we're, we're in a lot of trouble here. We have a tremendous amount of waste that we're creating by throwing everything away. And, um, you know, in terms of the, you know, if you're working in architecture and environmental work around that, you'll realize that, you know, around 40% of our landfill waste is construction and demolition debris. So this is especially upsetting to me. Um, but a lot of it is just, you know, we just don't have this connection anymore with things. Um, Basically, convenience that we say is, you know, the ultimate, um, we have this freedom from toil mentality as being the ideal. I'm personally a believer in freedom through toil, <laughs> so I <laughs> find it to be really liberating and empowering. But, you know, when you're giving everything away, you don't have to think about them anymore. You don't have to figure them out anymore, right? Um, you hear about, uh, you know, these stories, and we post them all the time. Anyone I know who does environmental work are always posting these stories about how they've made you know, uh, affordable housing out of like just bottle caps and like some amazing scraps and stuff. And, you know, it's incredible the, the ingenuity around these things, but we, you know, in our culture, we really don't do that. Um, we couldn't even in many cases because of zoning and whatnot. So it's discouraged. Uh, we're increasingly detached from the physical world in general as a result. Um, I personally think this is why a lot of people don't seem to think we have a, an issue environmentally. Um, we are in climate controlled spaces all of the time. It's always 72 degrees in our lives for a lot of people. Um, you know, we don't have to garden and get our food that way. We don't have to interact really with the outside very much. Um, and planned obsolescence is another issue. Um, you know, things were built to fail after a short period of time so that you'll have to buy more of these things, right? Um, you know, it's interesting thinking about everything that, that happened with COVID, um, is happening with COVID in terms of the environment, um, and our lack of connection. I mean, people were, they had to shut down the cemetery near me because it, it was so crowded full of people, myself included, you know, every day wanting to go just to be in nature now in a way that 
maybe we hadn't before that. Like we're starting to appreciate that and, and hopefully that'll be something that sticks. Um, but in general, you know, it, it's hard to care about things you don't understand. Um, you know, this is, you know, it, this is again, our problem with the environment. Um, if we don't have this connection to it, we don't understand it. Um, we're not working it with our own hands and in it very often, it's easy to not care about it. Um, it's also, of course, you know, where racism and other things stem from, frankly, we don't understand other people, we aren't exposed to them, then, um, you know, we, we have opinions that are unfortunate. Um, and, uh, you know, this lack of understanding can actually often leads to fear and indifference, which is why I think people sort of double down on things like climate change um, uh, in terms of being deniers. So we have to be aware of that. It, 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 just you know occurred to me that we can't expect people to to care about these things until we we create these links between them and the environment um or, or whatever that thing is right um or you know the apocalypse happens. so <laughs> um so yeah solutions reestablish these relationships um meeting people where they actually are uh I love my work. I love historic preservation. One of the greatest things about it is that people are super, super passionate about saving these places because they're deeply meaningful places. And I mean, any number of reasons. Um, the trick is to not judge people for not um, being in the same place that you are, right? Just because they don't know about, you know, whatever the issue should be, let's say environmental issues or the damage they're causing by, you know, using drinking bottled water all the time, for example, single use uh, bottles, things like that. Um, maybe they think they're being really healthy because they're afraid that they're, they have kids and they don't want their kids drinking lead water, you know, uh, lead in their water, et cetera. So trying to sort of, it's hard. I mean, preservation is the same as the environmental people. It's why I like both of these fields so much, you know, like we feel really, really strongly about this stuff, but you can't, uh, get anywhere if you shut people down right away by, uh, by being, you know, too hard on them. So, um, so finding a way to, to bridge that gap, I think is really important and finding ways to demystify these things is really important. Um, you know, to actually get them to a point where they're, they're empowered and then they can educate others. Um, it's really easy to do this with younger people. I've noticed, um, I used to give tours a lot to high school kids, um, environmental tours and, and by the end of it, they would just be like, oh my gosh, why do my parents do this? I can't believe it. They're horrible. You know, and I'd be like, I'm not going to say your parents are horrible, but you can go home and you can make your parents feel pretty bad about what they're, what they're doing, maybe if they're, you know, uh, have some bad practices. Um, so, uh, you know, the goal is to, of course, sort of grow that information, grow that knowledge um, and to get your damn hands dirty, you know, encourage people to to get in there, to get into the work. Um, it feels good. We shouldn't be shying away from uh, from these things, from the environment, from you know, broken objects, which I'll talk a bit more about, because um, that was sort of my my gateway to trying and create a connection between the general population and uh, historic preservation, um, but really the general population and um, uh, the built environment and, uh, the, the environment in general. So, um, so yeah, no, sorry, that's a little bit low res. Uh, so in 2012, uh, I read an article in the New York times about a woman who had started a repair clinic, a repair cafe, she called it in Amsterdam. And I hadn't heard of these before. This was like a new concept, right? I mean, of course, repair shops are not a new concept, but, um, you know, in the same way, the maker movement came along and all of a sudden it's been sort of like rebranded uh, in a way and, and reintroduced through a, a new cultural lens. Um, you know, I had never heard of anything like that and it was, you know, really successful. And she started, you know, all of these, she's in a basement here and a this, that, and they sort of start spreading all over the place, these repair clinics. And it was really inspired by that. Um, you know, it, uh, uh, so, you know, as I said, my, my background is uh, I've done a lot of work with volunteering and volunteers. Um, I've done a lot of work around sustainability and preservation work. Um, and I'm very interested in my community and trying to be helpful in my community. Um, and in terms of historic preservation, I was concerned because there seemed to be this real disconnect between um, people knowing how to, you know, use a drill you know, like we just don't, again, we outsource everything now. So people don't really know how to repair things. And 
meanwhile, everyone in my field is like, I can't believe these people want new construction and old construction is so much better. And it is, by the way, but uh, you know, like why, why aren't people wanting these things and getting uh, judgmental around it sometimes? And, um, and kind of the same with my environmental friends you know, in ways too, just kind of like, I can't believe people, you know, don't understand things like embodied energy and what that means. And sometimes, you know, we just need to make sure we're doing a good job educating people around that in a way that we're meeting them in the right way. But um, it, it just occurred to me that you couldn't really expect somebody to, you know, fix up some big Queen Anne that frankly takes a tremendous amount of labor and know-how and dexterity. Um, or money, um, and or money, I should say, when when they they can't fix like a toaster, or you know, like, like they're not quite sure how to like glue an ornamental plate back together, right? Like it's just not fair to assume. Like they should be scared. They're not equipped to do that. Um, and and that's not everybody's. It's not your fault. Like we live in a world that encourages you to outsource everything, right? So um, so that's why I was like, all right, I'm really inspired by this clinic this seems like a good starting point. Like, let's, let's start with a toaster and, you know, move up to a Queen Anne, you know, like once people kind of get their chops, right? Um, so I'm trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to do this? I posted something on Facebook about it. Uh, like, I want to do this, rawr, you know, and uh, my friend Allie, um, who co-owned a cafe that I uh, would, uh, you know, do a lot of my writing and stuff out of, she was like, hey, you can use the cafe, right? Um, we'll start them there. And I was like, well, that sounds great. This means I actually might do it. Right. So, uh, Ellie's, uh, currently works for the alderman here in Edgewater and she's just, she knows everybody. She has really strong local connections. Um, the cafe was the actual physical space that was going to work. Um, and so, uh, so we ended up, you know, basically starting it together. Um, for this reason, it was perfect. Um, we kind of combined our skills and, um, Amazingly enough, our fixers, our volunteers, um, and by the way, we are also volunteers, uh, you know, we just had this incredible crew. We had engineers, we had carpenters, um, you know, editors, like um, marketing people. We, to be fair, we only have one subatomic physicist uh, who volunteers with us. That's a little bit misleading, but, um, you know, there's probably, I don't know, I'd say eight or nine of us uh, who are there pretty much every month. I mean, I was there every month, but, uh, but you know, they're just incredible and their skill sets. Some of them are directly related to their work, but most of them aren't, uh, by their work. I mean, like they're sort of paid, uh, jabby jobs, you know, that, that they do. Um, you know, we have, uh, three to four sewists, uh, which I learned was the proper way of saying a uh, person who sews a sewist. Um, and they are amazing. They're sort of, uh, like this, this little tight crew and they're always uh, sharing tips on everything. And they're like really intense and they get so much done. Um, even through the pandemic, I've been like getting my socks darned and like helping and like fixing things in return. It's been like, it's like really nice little swap. We sort of do at least between us um, until we can get back into a space and, and it's safe, but uh, they're incredible. They probably do more of the work than anybody. Um, but we also have people who are really good for electronics, um, you know, any sort of, uh, you know, mechanical work. I'm much better on that front. I won't touch electronics, um, you know, just kind of anything. And we bring our tools with us and um, we have a regular space. We stay in Edgewater right now. Um, we've been at a maker space that Allie's partner, Stu, runs uh, called Edgewater Workbench, although I'm, I'm not sure that's going to be possible uh, once the pandemic ends, unfortunately. Uh, so we'll figure out another space, but through the years, I should also say we've moved around a bit. We started at Ali's cafe, um, and she sold that. So then we were in a, a theater space for a little while, which was this black box theater that would move around. And so every month it would be like, you know, one month it would be like grandma's living room. And we'd just sort of like work around it and bring our, you know, task lighting in and our toolboxes and stuff. And then the next month it would be like, like urban landscape with graffiti, you know, so we never quite knew. And it was, it was really fun. It's a very portable, easy uh, thing to move around a repair clinic, uh, turns out. So, um, so uh, yeah. Uh, also, you know, of course, the fourth component is our, is our community. And people come from all over the place, actually. People come in from the suburbs sometimes. Um, you know, a lot of people are local to Edgewater, but certainly not all of them. 
Uh, and in terms of uh, us going out more into the world, you know, I really wanted to anchor it more in Edgewater uh, in large part because, you know, I don't want our volunteers to get burned out by going all over the city. Uh, but we've done a couple of times, we've done it through Plant Chicago at the plant. Um, we were supposed to be at their new location at, in a firehouse uh, last month, but that was canceled for obvious reasons. Um, but we, we really do try to stay local, but we have like, like for example, um, in this picture on the far right, uh, this was a group of people who came in from, I can't remember, I think it might've, I think it might've been Auburn Gresham. I think, I'm not positive, forgive me. Um, you know, just wanting to start something possibly in their neighborhood. So they came to see how we did it. And then I, you know, sat down and talked with them for a while about how to replicate it, you know, lessons learned basically. Um, so, you know, that's been really rewarding too. And a couple of them have sprung up as a result, which has been super cool to see. Um, so yeah, we need people, we need people to come in with broken things or we're bored. So, uh, and usually we're pretty slammed, so it's not a problem, but, uh, you know, the people who volunteer with community, we really love doing it. It's fun. We use the hive mind, we share information. It's a great feeling. The people who have their objects repaired, it's like, becomes this like magical object to them afterwards, like Lazarus rising from the dead, you know? And so, and the other thing about, you know, creating a relationship with objects in that regard is, um, you know, once you open something up and you really look at it and you get to understand it better, whether the person who comes in with the broken object is really being hands-on with our volunteer um, or if the volunteer is kind of doing it and the other person just kind of watching, um, there's still like a, an element of fascination. There's still something really special about that object after it's fixed for people. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we'll fix it and then it'll break again and they'll come back, you know, and it, they can't let it go, you know, if that happens or it's just more cherished because we've created a bond with it, right? Um, so anyway, that's uh, another really fun, rewarding thing. Um, so yeah, what do we fix? We fix anything. I mean, like you, literally anything. We have some strange things who have come in through the doors and we're always delighted the weirder they are, frankly. Uh, so yeah, really anything you can wheel in, we're going to work on it. Um, oh, and that picture on the bottom right is when we were in the theater space, obviously with all of the graffiti and stuff, which is, is lovely. Um, so, uh, yeah, but you know, electronics, lamps, toys, bikes, clothes, ceramics, jewelry, shoes, record players, string instruments, um, not always string instruments. It depends who, what volunteers there, but, um, uh, appliances, uh, but you know, we, we will seriously like try anything, uh, with the caveat of like, you know, we might not be able to fix it. And if we can't fix it, then we can at least usually diagnose it really well. Like it might be a matter of, you really need to get this part. We can't do anything because, you know, we have tools with us, but we don't have, you know, specific parts for things, of course. Um, back in the very beginning, uh, we had a little 3D printer where we would actually sometimes print out a little piece if it was just like, say it's a vacuum cleaner. And, you know, just some little L-shaped thing or like whatever is broken and you can't buy it because they're not, you know, you know, these places don't want you to be able to buy it. They want it to break. So you have to buy another vacuum or pay them a lot to have them fix it. So we were able to print these little pieces out. The trouble with that, and, and it might not be so hard now, um, it was just very energy intensive and it took a long time to print things out with a 3D printer. So, um, so we stopped doing that at a certain point, but it would be really great to bring, to bring that back, frankly. Um, I, I am not as up on the technology that way, so I'd have to sort of see what that would look like. Um, but all that to say, you know, by diagnosing it, um, we can at least tell people what they do need. Or in some cases, if it's really just if it's something with a heat element, like there was one time, luckily, we were in the theater space where there's a concrete uh, floor, you know, like... You know, things can sometimes maybe set on fire, for example, if it's uh, <laughs> like not in great shape and something short, short circuits on it. So be careful, be very aware of that in whatever space, you know, you might be working on something, of course. Um, but the fixing was really important, but I was, again, which I sort of alluded to in the very beginning in my preamble, um, you know, so much of it to me was also really about community. Um, you know, it's, it's mostly locals who are here, but, um, again, people come from all over the place and they often come back many times, which is really heartwarming, but also we get new people all the time, which is also like really nice. Um, it's definitely like a multi-generational thing, which is great. Uh, there was this one woman who was in her nineties and she, her caretaker would bring her in and she had all of this jewelry that was 
all had frogs incorporated into it. <laughs> and there's like, <laughs> like three frog rings and like a, a frog earring we'd fix like every session for a while. Like she just had like an endless supply of this stuff. It was amazing. Um, but I love that. I love that our volunteers really run the gamut in terms of their backgrounds and their ages and like everything. Um, and it's, it's really beautifully collaborative. Um, and so, yeah, and uh, you know, all skill sets are welcome. People are like, oh, I don't want to come to your repair clinic because I don't know how to fix things. And I'm like, well, that's why we have volunteers. Like we will fix those things for you or we will certainly try um, and have a pretty good track record. Um, and you can be as involved as you want to be. There's no problem with that. Um, that's encouraged, actually. They were kind of trying to reach an audience that's a little uncomfortable a lot of the time. Um, so uh, in skill sharing, uh, we've had a lot of just independent, like, little mentorships between our volunteers spring up where they're constantly swapping skills and ideas. Um, and some people who brought things in originally just to be fixed who started volunteering because they just loved it so much and they realized it was really fun. Um, so, uh, so yeah, um, you know, we're, we're in this mess because of overconsumption um, and things again, like planned obsolescence and our just sort of general um, uh, ethos in this country. Uh, you know, we, we talk about things like recycling and there's been a lot of talk about how recycling is not really the greatest um, in recent days. We reuse things. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, you know, we repurpose things, but um, repurposing is a little different than repair. I think a lot of people, when we started this clinic, re repurposing became, was really hot. You know, it's like upcycling and everything. Um, and it's great, you know, totally repurpose. But um, we're missing repair in in our sort of general discussion around these things a lot of the time in the environmental world. And uh, we have to repair things. Like it's great, you know, this vacuum, uh, yeah, this vacuum could be a flower pot, sure. But like, so could like my hand, you know, <laughs> like, like the most simple thing. So, you know, there's 187 parts in that vacuum that, you know, were extracted and flown all over the world and assembled and then, you know, um, like we should kind of honor those things as well, instead of just gutting them, tossing them and making a flower pot maybe. So, you know, and if it can't be fixed, it can't be fixed to me. I'm like, all right, it can't be fixed. Now we repurpose. Right. Um, so that's, that's just how I feel about it. But, um, uh, a couple of stats, uh, only 1% of our consumer products are still in use six months after purchase which just blew my mind. Um, and for every one can of garbage a person produces, there are 70 produced at factories and manufacturing plants, meaning everything that went into creating the amount of trash and, and that you know amount of space, um, there was so much waste created as a result of creating those original products that you threw out. So just you know, focusing on mindfulness around these things. Um, uh, you know, collaboration and creativity. Another reason, as I, I've mentioned already, you know, still sharing empowerment. People, they, they, they're so excited. I mean, look at this lady. Like, look how excited this lady is about her lamp. Like, she's freaking out. Lamps, like, really get people excited, by the way. They're the, the thing we, we fix the most. Um, and there's something about, like, literally turning a light bulb on, you know? It's, like, really exciting. It's pretty easy fix, so it's great. Um, you know, empowerment. Um, neighborliness, you know, again, people friendships have begun out of this. And, and by the way, like I work with a lot of contractors and stuff. And when I started this, I kind of thought like, oh, I'll, I'll twist the arms of my contractor friends and get them, get them in here because they're so handy. And then I was like, oh yeah, contractors don't really like to work for free very much, you know, especially when it's what they're doing, what they're doing all day for paid work. So the interesting thing is of um, all of our volunteers, I didn't know any of them. In the very beginning, I had one friend um, who was volunteering but for years now, I haven't known any of our regular volunteers outside. Like they, I got to know them only because of Community Glue, which is amazing. And I think that's probably true for Allie as well. Um, so that says a lot to me. And I, in my community has expanded greatly as a result. Um, so just from like a sort of more practical standpoint, since, you know, again, I know some of you are going to be thinking about projects maybe at some point with C3 um, or you're curious about starting your own stuff. Uh, so, uh, you know, things we could probably use with community glue that we always talk about, um, you know, some sort of an intern would be great. You know, we're always open to new ideas, uh, marketing. I, I kind of do all the admin and volunteer stuff. So, I, you know, and, you know, of course I have like other jobs and things that I'm doing too. So 
I fall behind with it, you know, basic stuff like just getting the word out more, maintaining their email list better, doing more e-blasts and stuff. Uh, you know, sometimes our, our fixer volunteers will, will kick in on this and they're amazing. Um, but, you know, something, someone to do that consistently, if you have a program like this is really helpful. Um, you know, we don't, I should have said too, uh, the repair clinics are totally free. I don't like, that's just never really been, um, you know, we, we, we talked about, oh, we could monetize this, this and that. And I was just like, I just don't, I don't want to, um, I don't want that to ever be a barrier to people being able to do this. And I think our volunteers really like that too. Um, it keeps everything light. It keeps the mood light. It's just fun. Um, that said, we have like a jar and people will, you know, like if you feel like shoving some money in there, go for it, but like zero expectation. Um, and we find people actually have been pretty generous overall. And we just use that to, you know, for things like marketing materials like this, you know, we have t-shirts, uh, community glue t-shirts and stuff, a friend designed pro bono for us. Um, we, you know, occasionally I'll get like food or stuff like that. Um, but you know, it's mostly like we're running out of glues. We're running out of this tool or that, like, like light bulb sockets. I know people are not going to have them when they come in, so we'll buy them. Um, we don't always have them, but we try to, I try to stock up periodically. So we have some of those things. Um, Oh, well, I guess I talked about tools and stuff a bit too, but, um, and also volunteer appreciation. So, um, I'm sure they would kill me for putting this in the slide. <laughs> this was our holiday party where we went to this wonderful little, uh, Korean karaoke place on Lincoln Avenue. And it was very fun. I will tell you, and very revealing. I was surprised, um, by the complete, uh, obsession with country music from one of our volunteers. Um, it was very entertaining. And, you know, just use that to, to pay for the karaoke, have a few drinks, um, unwind. Uh, they're incredibly dedicated volunteers. I can't even tell you, like, there would be no, I can't fix all this stuff, you know, <laughs> like, like they're amazing. Um, and they ask for nothing and they do it because they love it and they like the community that we've created. Um, so I think that's about all I had for you guys. Um, but I would love to take any questions that you have. I'm sure I forgot to say a hundred things. Um, but thank you so much for listening. Awesome. Thank you so, so much, Carla. That was so much fun. Um, and I learned so much. Oh my goodness. What a wild ride. Um, I came to my attention that we had some technical issues with the chat. So mm -hmm. for folks out there, um, we're running out of time, but hang on to those questions, please. You will get a follow-up email from us and respond to that email and we'll get answers to folks. So we'll definitely answer questions, just not at this time, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah. I know, I love the question parts, but we'll mm -hmm. share those with you so we can get the real um, answers yeah. to folks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, um, but thank you again, Carla, for um, sharing all that. It was so much fun. And thank you everyone for coming out today. Uh, you can stay connected to the C3 community and find information about our upcoming trainings if you're keen now that you know a little bit more about what it's about and other volunteer opportunities by signing up for our monthly newsletter. And again, if you have any resources you would like to amplify or need help, just please uh, call us at 773 seven five 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 one hundred or email us at c3 uh, at naturemuseum.org but thank you everyone really appreciate thank it so much yeah look forward to the questions